Hello and uh, welcome to a very special edition of Chew the Fat, the slightly unusual time of seven o'clock on a Sunday. Um, now, as you will know, unless you've been hiding on the moon somewhere, after a 10-year wait, 10 years plus even, uh, finally, Masters of the Air, the somewhat considered sequel, if you soft sequel, if you like, to uh, Band of Brothers and Band of Brothers Pacific, is finally on our television screens, and the first two episodes dropped on Friday. I've already done a short review of episodes one and two on the channel, just my initial gut reaction, which, guess what, is in the gut reactions folder on the channel. But I wanted to do a far more detailed analysis of the first two episodes, um, what our criticisms may be, uh, and what the strengths of the show uh, are. Talk about it in a bit more general terms, and also our hope uh, for the other episodes to come. To help me dissect this big sumptuous cake of a World War II TV series, I've got two very special guests. Uh, one of them is a man who has very similar tastes uh, in films to my good self. I first saw him on the channel of the uh, Critical Drinker, my good buddy. Uh, and uh, he is a man who really is into his history, I also then got to do a stream with him where we talked about all things Napoleon, which was hugely uh, entertaining. Uh, but for the first time on the Outcast Creative channel, I'm very pleased to welcome History Bro, Bo. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, no, my, the pleasure's all mine. Now, because you're a new guest, and by the way, the links for Bo's channel and all that kind of stuff, you want to follow him on Twitter and everything else, uh, are just down below in the information. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions just to... Um, establish your 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 tastes um if you like can you remember whether it was well i guess actually i'll ask you both what was the first war film that you probably watched on tv as a kid that that, that maybe created an impression the very first war film not world war ii but any war yeah, let's go with world war ii let's go with world okay. war ii yeah well it's funny one of the earliest ones i remember ever seeing was the Guns of Navarone, which is a, a pretty old, pr pretty obscure. It's not one of the most famous ones. But having said that, that's sort of an early, early memory. That was, one of that the was, ones... huge, it was huge at the, at, at, in its day, though. And right, yeah. that was quite an event movie when that was on telly for the first time, which I think would have been mid to late 70s, maybe. Yeah, I think it was originally came out in in the sixties or something. But yeah. yeah, also, but one of the ones that had a, a big impact on sort of my childhood, if you like. Uh, probably a lot of people say the same is the great escape right um, yeah absolutely love the great escape must have seen it dozens of times and if it's just if i'm flicking on the telly and it's on i will just stop and and watch it even now sort of obviously no no it's a no-brainer um but my favorite world war ii film easily is a bridge too far ah oh, um, mate I absolutely I have... love a bridge too far there's the vinyl. i don't know if you can see it let me tilt the camera there's the vinyl soundtrack brilliant it, absolutely it's really rare to get that on vinyl and it opens double sort of double out you know it's not a double album but it's got the double kind of spread and it's got a massive uh photo of 30 core getting their asses kicked uh yeah you know, and sort the of german line <clears throat> of course the sort of uh the the trademark main theme tune to it is is brilliant but as yeah. i got older and became an adult i read uh the cornelius ryan book and then yeah. I've reread it a number of times. There's a half a dozen or so books that I sort of endlessly reread. I never get bored of it. And so I've reread A Bridge Too Far uh, a silly number of times and watched the film a silly number of times. Um, and so, uh, and so yeah, that's sort of a big one for me. But uh, have you I've... ever seen the um, slightly um, uh, unofficial but accidentally released once on video? Uh, rough cut of the film which um which had um several scenes in it that is in the original script so i've got the uh, original script and um uh it's got a scene where the americans are trying to break through to nijmegen bridge and and they kind of they're lost in the streets and they get ambushed by the germans and they all get massacred um, I'm not sure if I have, you know. Yeah, you know, that that was accidentally released on video in the 80s and rapidly withdrawn because it was the it was the sort of edit that was prior to the main edit that was released. And it's about 20 minutes longer. 
And it's also got some extra shots of 30 core in it, including some um, shots of the real 30 core edited into the film, where presumably hmm. we're marking as we're going to add extra shots here. Here's a temporary. Uh, and my hmm. friend had a copy of it and I went round to see it. Um, and we've been trying to find a, another copy of it ever since because it appears that one got got thrown out. But I have seen it for myself, and those extra scenes are in the screenplay. Um, yeah. And we did no, a I whole. Don't, I don't think I've ever seen that. I would love to see yeah. it because, of course, there's some real footage right at the beginning of the film. You know, there's a voiceover, isn't there? Right yeah, the we leave sort of, Allman. Okay. Um, and uh, but I've seen Dickie Attenborough, obviously the director, talk about how. Um, he sort of didn't want to use any real footage because there's the, the sequence where they're all dropping out. Um, yeah. And and he sort of did it all again for real. Yeah. And uh, I've seen uh, Richard Asper say that he deliberately chose not to sort of splice in any real footage there. Uh, so that's interesting that, that what you're talking about, they, they did do that. Um, I, well, guess I think it was placeholder footage. It was like a rough cut. And it was a longer right. cut of the movie and, and clearly wasn't, I don't know how that version ended up being accidentally released, but um, there are some, there are some other people online that have got one here, by the way, is an original call sheet from bridge too far for the nine Megan attack. And there's uh there's the stunt team and there's Robert Redford on the call sheet <laughs> and the Attenborough, see the Attenborough army, personal <laughs> army, APA as they were known. Um, and it's got like, even the maps of where people are going to be picked up and driven and all that. Somebody gave that to me as a present. It's an original. It's not a copy. So cool. um, Yeah, I know we're both kindred spirits insofar as Operation Market Garden. Is sort of, um... <laughs> we're going to have to do a separate stream on that. <laughs> yeah, we're we're so getting probably, slightly so... diverted. Let's, uh, yeah. let's move on to Masters of the Air. Bring my uh, next guest in. Um, the Inside Man has been on my channel many times before. He's called the Inside Man for a reason, because like myself, he also works in the film and television industry. And he had some involvement in Masters of the Air. That's all we're going to say. Uh, he has been there during the production, so he'll be able to give us some valuable sight. He may or may not have been responsible for me getting this hat. <laughs> yeah, I'd really like that hat. Where on earth did you get that from? I don't know. It just turned up mysteriously. Uh through the post one day, uh, along with also some Band of Brothers uh, original screenplays, uh, which I have on the shelf over there. So, um, yeah. So, so Bo, make sure that you give out your address. You never know what, well, not, not publicly, but you never know what you might get through, through your door. Okay, so we're going to talk about Masters of the Air. This show has indeed been a really long time coming. Um. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about it online. Uh, there's a lot of uh, praise. Uh, it's had some pretty good reviews from, you know, the major uh, press junkets and all of that, and the, the big boys like The Guardian and so on. Um, uh, before we um, get into what you guys um, think of the show, I take it that you've both seen the first two episodes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Inside Man, have you seen any of the other episodes? Because there are some people that have seen the entire... No, I've not. No, seen nothing of the others. Nothing right, because the fighting on film guys got to see the whole season. They, they got they got sent uh... it by Apple. Lucky buggers. Yeah, yeah. They, told, yeah they told me I wasn't going to be disappointed. I do have an issue with it so far. So I guess I'm going to start off with my, my criticisms um and, and i've really only got one it's quite a big one but i do i do like the show so far uh just say hello to the people in the chat good to see you david good to see you melvin uh good to see you, sandy q uh so i don't think sandy's been on the channel before so welcome mr brown alliance is here as well he's also got his own channel um so yeah and there's uh history bro heard of him okay so um this is my issue with it, um, is that we've got, I think we've got nine episodes. They're roughly around 45 minutes to an hour each. Um, and the first episode basically involves the, the, the crews arriving in England. There's a stop off in Greenland. In the bar in Greenland, we're introduced to a whole plethora of characters, but the show centers around the friendship predominantly between Two characters who train together, played by Austin Butler and Callum Turner, two fantastic powerhouse actors, if there ever were. Um, 
which does very much feel like the relationship between Ron Livingston and Damian Lewis that we had in Band of Brothers. One is slightly withdrawn and stoic and kind of brooding charisma, and the other one gets drunk a lot and shouts and dances on planes and things. That that I don't have a problem with. I don't even mind that that similarity. But we, we are straight into the action. We're straight into a mission in episode one once people have arrived and stuff. There's a lot of characters, and I don't feel like we got to know any of them. Some people get killed straight away. I don't feel like we got to know any of those people that got killed. I would have preferred a whole first episode with no mission and just all about the characters. Let's get to know these people. Let's get to like these people. Let's find out a bit more about what the personal stakes are for them. We know the, the main stakes of World War II, defeating Hitler and all of that. I would have been quite happy to have one episode with absolutely no action in it, just maybe some stuff with them training in America, seeing them training on the B-17s for the very first time, maybe a bit of background about how some of them got into flying in the first place, um, that sort of stuff. I feel like we're, 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 we're straight in. We don't really know these boys. And I guess their persona is going to grow on us as, as the show goes. But that's my main beef with the show at the moment. I've got lots of good things to say about it, but I just want to start with gripes, and that's that's my my gripe. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, having sort of come straight in without too much of a uh, you know establishing the relationships and establishing the characters, that you know that that it you do kind of feel that like you've come in a little bit quick. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't feel rushed at all, but I just wonder whether one of the one of the core reasons is that these these men you know their relations their relationships with uh with their their crews and other members of uh of the hundredth uh bomb group uh was so transient because so many died you know so many were killed um, yeah you know a lot during training um during during yeah. their, their practice runs and training missions you know, a hell of a lot um and i wonder whether you know that's the reason why we we haven't really been shown an enormous amount of the the cast. You know, no, I, well, I mean, I feel like we've been introduced to lots of characters. That that that, yeah. that kind of Goodfellas scene in the bar where yeah yeah we're going around the bar. It's very Goodfellas and all the different characters are named. Yeah. And I, you know, the ones that stuck in my memory is the guy with the gold teeth because he's got gold oh, teeth. Ham. Ha, ham, There's ham, one guy ham who looks ham. really sort of young and and. Looks like he should be on the side of an ice cream cone packet or something. <laughs> so, but uh, history, bro. What are what are your what are your thoughts on this particular issue? Um, before you, yeah, uh, I think as a fair enough criticism, I don't necessarily uh, a, a, agree with it. I think it was done quite well. I do see what you mean though, because you know that's what they do in Band of Brothers, isn't it? The whole first episode yeah. is is in training. It would have been nice. Um, it actually would have been nice to see them sort of training in america there's sort of one line where they said oh we've had hundreds of hours of of, of, of uh, flying yeah. already and they just mention it the yeah. uh, the only reason why I, the reason why i would probably say that it's not uh, it doesn't bother me too much um is that uh it, it it could be too slow if you do that you know band of brothers handles that exactly that very very well almost perfectly yeah. doesn't it um mm. and it could easily be a bit too slow and although it's not a problem for me personally I think people nowadays, audiences nowadays, have got sort of increasingly shorter attention spans. Which is a real and shame, and it, it it's did, a shame. That is a shame. I feel um, like I, I feel like that's why we didn't have that episode. Personally. Yeah, you're probably yeah, and I imagine um, it's. I'm it's, oh, sorry, I was just going to say. I think it must yeah. be very, very difficult to be a screenwriter, and yeah. um, and, and you know, because it's obviously been a artistic or, or, or an, an, an editorial decision not to do that. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, you can't sort of please everyone. Uh, and yeah, it does suffer a tiny bit from who are these guys? Who's this guy? Oh, he's dead now. Um, but I think as Inside Man says, that probably reflects real life, real war a bit, is that you're thrown in with a, a, a bunch of guys. Uh, maybe not if you've been training with them for months and months and months, but in combat, you're thrown in with a bunch of guys and suddenly some of them are dead and you barely knew their name. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I think it's that's funny. realistic. It, it, you know? it, it, it's funny saying saying that there was something actually in the in the book 
uh, in the Masters of the Air book where I think I think it was it Egan's who said that there was um, there was a guy that they just didn't know his name and it was his first day and he went out with one of the crews you know um, and they because they didn't know his name they and he, he died on his first mission he was just known as the man who came to dinner they didn't know who the guy was um, so there is that I suppose you know that you know a level of um not anonymity but a, a, you know a level of just you know these a lot of these men had no identity to these crews to a lot of these crews because they were replacements coming in hmm. you know so there there is possibly you know that's possibly one of the reasons <clears throat> for those for those people watching masters of the air is also not just based on one book there is hmm. masters of the air written by um Donald L. Miller, but the main character who is narrating us through um, episode one, who goes on to be the group, the group group navigator, would that be the correct? Yes, um, he is. Yeah, yeah. Group um, and he he's he's the one who's got the nickname of Bing Crosby or whatever. Yeah, he Bingo, also, okay, he, yeah. yeah. He also wrote a book, which I think <clears> you <throat> you've read, haven't you, Inside Man? Or was that you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's called. Uh, 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 yeah, a wing and a prayer, I believe. Harry Cross. Yeah, um, that's it. A wing and a prayer, uh, um, and um, and it's it's solely about his time in the hundredth bomb group. Yeah, um, and there's there's yeah, it's it's funny because it was only when I kind of um, zipped through a couple of bits and pieces of of the book um, yesterday when I knew that I was coming to do this that. I noticed that there were some quite big discrepancies in the show to um, yeah. what was in his memoir. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard about a few of those uh, already. I guess we'll 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 get into them. I mean, mm. in terms of first two episodes, history, bro. And I know you're a guy who really looks for your historical accuracy, and has um, probably got his red pen ready, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um on and just purely in terms of I'll, I'll, we'll get when we get to the end everybody can score the show so far and give it a rating but in terms of accuracy how happy were you very that? very i thought it looked brilliant yeah uh Agreed. i honestly thought to be quite honest um now i know a, a fair bit about world war ii <laughs> and a, a fair bit about world war ii era uh, aviation but it's not my absolute forte so yeah. there is someone who really really knows their stuff who's a, you know really knows everything there is to know about it may pick out things that are inaccuracies but i didn't i didn't spot anything certainly nothing glaring and just in general the cinematography and uh, i imagine a lot of it is sort of cgi or some of it it must be anyway yeah um it looked brilliant i thought um yeah. and i if you ever saw my criticism of napoleon especially the one i did on on lotus eaters i'm not scared to uh, be hypercritical um so i'm not just uh, blowing smoke up its ass for <laughs> for the sake no, of it sure. i genuinely genuinely thought it was one of the best things just in terms of just visuals aesthetics one of the best things i've seen in a long long time i thought it, some of the small details that i did pick out seemed uh, seemed uh, spotless seemed perfect so mm. i can't really fault it in, in in on any of that um yeah i mean the the only things i noticed occasionally was stuff like tarmac and whatnot and it, it, it's whether you want to um spend money on one thing or whether you want to spend money on a dump truck that's going to come and put sand everywhere that you've then got to clear up later and we've we've had that decision ourselves um to make uh, yeah uh, those kind of things don't bother me too much um as long as they've got the correct uniform correct insignia um i was very grateful that uh, like iron maiden wasn't in the soundtrack it, it, one of the things i <laughs> yeah. really loved about the film was it, it really fell back to an era of traditional storytelling it had a traditional score not a sound design score mm. um with you know with a with, with a hook or a beat that, i mean when i'd watched the first two episodes i was humming the theme all day and that that's that's the sound of a good soundtrack straight one off the of, bat one of the things i would say um without getting too uh 
uh, without getting too political, is sure. I, I was, I, I'm, I'm glad they didn't sort of deliberately race swap anyone, sort of try sure. and crowbar in uh, an, sure. an Indian person or something for the sake of it. Um, yeah. And I also I mean, think, again, that the the aesthetics, sometimes when they, uh, World War II era things, they sort of, I don't know, like make the women's haircuts over the top 40s, yeah. you know? Yeah. They, didn't, yeah. they didn't seem to do any of that that I could see. Uh, yeah, not so, all the women so it had. Was good. It was good. Not not all the women had like super bright red lipstick on. Right. Um, like yeah. in uh, Pearl Harbor, I think somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. V for V for Vianetta, Wolves Vianetta, I assume. <laughs> um, mentioned this, you know, that it was going to be overly dramatized. I mean, it. Yeah, it didn't feel like it had too much chrome. Um, yeah, I, I thought they they really got the they really got the the jargon right um you know the, yeah. the kind of tiny little details you know things like the bicycle the bicycle thing it might not mean much to uh your common or garden person but they were the the whole bicycle thing was a very very big thing for those airmen those um those those air crew um and surprisingly um there was an incredible amount of injuries sustained. Um, I think they said that at the, the start of their, their time over at these air bases, um, most of them were actually in hospital and in the infirmary for injuries sustained whilst riding bikes because hmm. of yeah. the um, of the, uh, uh, the the braking system that they had in the US, where you just sort of backpedal, whereas we have the you know the left and right brakes, but but it was th that was kind of one of those minor little details. But there was loads. I noticed loads and loads of little um, incredible details in their in their jargon and their mode of speech, um, yeah. which really really added to it. Yeah, it. it, it I mean, in terms of the um, the effects work, going back to um, mm. those comment. I don't think that they had any, from what I know, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong inside, man, I don't think they had any flying workable B-17s for the series at all. Uh, there were there were four um, four reproductions, I believe, yeah. that, that were that were created. Yeah, um, but but it, models on the ground, not fully uh, working. I, I believe there was... You see, I see. I wasn't over at the uh, the location, so I. I no, I, I know you were mainly interiors uh, and all that, but. Um, Sorry to uh, interject. I, Am I right in yeah. saying that there's very, very few B functional flying B seventeens in the world at all? Right. Yeah, there's I a think handful. there's, there's only like, like, I think there's two or something right, like that. Right. It, it's so. it's a, yeah a really minimal um, number. Uh, like you know, there's only yeah, one I know, flying I know, Lancaster. One... And I know no one B seventeen was uh, sadly last year um, you know, involved in a, a crash at an air display, which was oh, yeah, that's uh, right. rather terrible. Yeah, absolutely shocking. Yeah, um, um, was that where a fighter plane uh, uh, crashed yes, it into was. it and cut it in half in midair? Yeah, 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 yeah that was. was that was frightful footage. Yeah, right. yeah, terrible, really shocking. Um, um, did, but did the, anyone the, start to survive from the B seventeen? On, on I think no. everyone died. I think. Oh, mm. God, that's awful. Yeah. But but you're right. In the in terms of the uh, the CG work, I think um, this is really what CG was made for. This kind. Yeah. Of yeah. No. Absolutely. Um, it, I mean, it's so spot on. Um, you know, you look at some of the shots and the, you know, the hundreds of different elements involved in one particular shot. You know, the the flak, the flames, the the cloud cover, the the other aircraft, the increment coming aircraft, the trace of fire, um, the bailouts, all of that kind of stuff. You know, you you'll get a brief shot, and I noticed it in one of the trailers. I think it was the last trailer that dropped. Um, and I thought, oh my god, this there are so many elements that just could not be replicated um, using models or you know even reality. Um, which illustrates exactly what they went through, you know, the things that they witnessed. Um, but it was the CG, I think, is, is really spot on. And the only reason I think that we know that it's CG, not because it looks bad, we know that it's CG because it's the kind of thing that we know absolutely cannot be done for real, even with... No, you, yeah, it, yeah, on the basis that we don't have flying B-17s, yeah. Dan. This is yeah. the main... Um, 
<clears throat> location of the set. This is when it was in prep. I'm just pinching this from the, the Daily Mail. And then this is when it was um, built afterwards. And this is, you know, craft services. The, the, um, they actually built some sort of miniature studio sets, um, et cetera. And uh, there's all the Nissan huts in the top right. Yeah. Um, and I just think further along from this is where they had um, two, uh, your two um, planes. That's Bobbington, which was a different part of the, there we go. So, um, yeah, they had a, so there were four of these full size replicas. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I mean, my understanding is that they weren't airworthy, um, but uh, I could be wrong about that. But yeah, all the, all, the shot, all the flying shots to me, I can tell they're CG, but very, very good CG. It doesn't bother mm. me. Mm. Um, you know, uh, really, really good stuff. Um, I have to admit, in, in the first episode, when they were coming into land in Greenland, um, yeah. and the crew were getting thrown around inside mm. because of that air turbulence, and I remember coming into a, a landing like that myself, where we were worried about whether we were actually going to make it. <laughs> and um, and then, you know, they're, they're taxiing up because they've landed, and you see the next one coming in. Yeah. And he calls to him, pull up, pull up. I thought that guy was gonna, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm, and I'm guessing it's true that, that, that none of them, fortunately, were killed crashing uh, into Greenland on the way um, on the way over. I, I think um, a couple were, actually. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I think a couple were. There's, uh, I think, in fact, I think a few, quite a few were. Um, a lot of them didn't make it over, yeah. Let's get into um, let's get into the cast for the show because I mean, like with Band of Brothers and Pacific, there's a lot of unknowns in 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 the cast. It's a huge cast, but your key actors, um, it's been done very well. Uh, the timing is, is you know everybody knows who Austin Butler is because of the Elvis film. Yeah. So Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg totally knew what they were doing casting him yeah um callum turner had already had a number of great roles and of course he's also in the boys in the boat i believe um which is also a historical film i don't know if uh Bo, have you seen that one i haven't i'm afraid sorry no, it's, it's, no, i mean it's, it's worth checking out you know um I'm, I'm not sure watching rowing movies is your relaxing forte <laughs> pastime yeah. but um uh, i would say as far as acting goes it, it was pretty good. There was no one that really stood out as poor to me. No, no, uh, no one was like, "Oh, they're they're ruining it a bit," or every like mm. if, every line they say is just is just uh, poorly delivered or anything. No one really has stood mm. out. Um, uh, and on the, the flip side of that is that most of them seem to me anyway uh, e excellent. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, no, can't really fault it on that either. I, I I really do like a lot of the supporting cast. Uh, the actor on the left, uh, Jordan Coulson, I, I think is particularly good. Um, uh, this shot I really love because um, there's actual footage of these groups flying over to you know to do the mm. the daylight bombing of Berlin, kind of late forty four going into forty five, and and it looks exactly like this, you know, with the yeah the vapor trails and um all of that so it's a um great shot um yeah Cal callum turner's an english actor and there's i would say about 60 percent of the young speaking cast are british actors um and a, and to, to qualify for the various tax breaks and you know the fact that it yeah predominantly shot in the uk yeah. um they would have had to have had a certain percentage of um british cast exactly the same with um uh, Band of Brothers. Um, I don't think. And that of course, the same with the uh, same, same with Pacific. I mean, they they had a lot yeah. of uh, Australians, didn't they? Lot, That's right, they did. Yeah. They did have a lot of Australians. I don't know what that guy's doing in the back. Yeah, he he looks <laughs> like he's on the set of a different movie. What's going, <laughs> going on there? There is one. I have actually just while you were speaking, there, I have actually thought of one criticism, and it's very, it's pretty mild criticism. I mean, sure. I'm really kind of nitpicking, really. Uh, but you know, why not? Um, is uh, I can't I can't remember if it was in episode one or two. I think it must be in episode two when you see some uh, RAF guys. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, in the of, pub. Uh, yeah, in the pub. And 
sort of, of course, they're made out to be sort of, you know, ever so slightly wet. Uh, but um, yeah. I mean, that's what you, you're always going to get that from from an American production, I think. Mm. You know, uh, uh, look, uh, one of the classic examples, isn't it, is Saving Private Ryan, where Gold and Sword Beach are sort of, I think, barely mentioned or, you know, not mm. really mentioned or, you know, lots Monty's of things overrated. <laughs> <laughs> or like in Independence Day, like it, it cuts to Paris and London like for two seconds. But it's basically, the it's the basically British, the Americans. The Americans that, do that everything. Scene with you know? the two British pilots in Independence Day, and it's yeah. like the only two British actors working in LA at the time. <laughs> it's it's a message from the Americans. What do they yeah. want us to do? I think it sort of sort of reminds me slightly of that also that scene in um, in Band of Brothers episode four of Band of Brothers. You know, well if we can't see it, oh boy, we can't shoot it. Yeah, that, yeah. you know yeah. that which they kind of. The, so they the do it in Band of Brothers as well, don't they? They just mention, uh, they they just mention the British Airborne. and it was almost in passing yeah. in one episode, don't they? And uh, I, I mean, it's what you're going to get. Uh, so yeah. you know, I can't, I, you know, I'm used to it, and uh, you know, can't get too upset. But it, that yeah. that is a, a slightly mild criticism. Uh, but then one thing I actually thought, I, I, if, if if I'm getting ahead of your schedule, no, no. your, your schedule, Lance, uh, for what we're no, going to no, talk not about, at all. But, it's um, fairly loose, but uh, the, jump in. The, there's the 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 whole discussion of or the whole point about daylight versus night raids. Yeah. Um. And, and of course, the uh, the RAF were doing night raids, and uh, you know the the eighth uh, the eighth air force, the the mighty eighth, was doing daylight raids. You know, unescorted as soon as you get past Belgium or into Germany, unescorted mm. daylight raids. I mean. You've got to give it to those boys. Uh, yeah. It's absolute. It's it's pretty much insane, really, in yeah. hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but um, sorry, I'm probably getting ahead of. Getting no, ahead no, of no. Time. I mean, you're not at all. I mean, because you do have to give it to them. Because not only did they have to, they were that it was during the day. Anybody that got flew out of formation or whatever, which is as we saw in the show, is very easy to do. Mm. Or if you get damaged, you're a limp. You're a limping duck, and you can't keep up. You're going to get picked off. You've also got to go past rings of network of uh, anti-aircraft guns. And um, I thought that scene was very good, where it showed all the German 88 crews coming out. I mean, again, it was a big CGI effect. Um, I think they might have had one real 88 gun there, duplicated several times. Um, uh, wasn't even sure if they had that. But I, I, I still think it was great the way they showed that. And that was uh, supposed to be in Holland as they were um coming over the coast and uh there was a, you know stuff like the explanation of that that particular device that was invented for precision bombing i forget or the, the name. northern the northern site the northern the northern uh, site thank you yeah um yeah. you know I, I i sort of i'm not I, i'm a big world war ii guy but i'm i'm also not a particularly aviation uh guy i'm, I'm more about airborne forces and beaches and this tanks and that kind of thing um that, that to have that explained to me in quite layman's terms i actually found that really useful yeah, um, yeah. so i imagine if i found it useful you know your average uh, viewer um, would have been able to digest it so i thought that, that stuff was there was quite a bit of exposition but it was exposition in a way that felt very digestible it, rather it than really was in, you're absolutely that, right it was it was done in a in a very very um a, a, a very very calculated way in yeah. terms I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way but in a very very calculated way to impart the maximum amount of information um with the minimum amount of what looks like expository dialogue um so, so it's really really cleverly done this actor um nikolai kinski wonder if any if he's any relation to klaus kinski it might be I his wonder. son yeah could be his son couldn't it um yeah I wonder if someone in chat wants to Google that and, ha and have it. I wouldn't be surprised. Let's just, let's, if it was. let's just let's just hope he doesn't have his temperament. I was going to say this actor sort of when we first meet him, I, I just got to, you know, immediate David Schwimmer vibes from yeah. Band of yeah. Brothers. You know, he's kind of you feel like he's going to make a bad decision. He yeah. actually, I think, made the right call about calling off the uh, the, the first raid because they couldn't see anything. So yeah. you know, it's pointless them trying to bomb that. Um, submarine base um yeah. i've actually found that submarine base that they were targeting um uh just south of bremerhaven um on oh, google right. earth 
I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up and um, show you in a sec. Uh, but and it's still there. You can you can Delvin you can Delvin in the chat says it is his son. It is oh, apparently God. according to. to oh, sorry, I'm not, Melvin. Sorry, I'm not, not surprised because he Melvin had that kind of very serious energy, and then he's got a stomach ulcer, and I guess we probably we're probably not going to see him again. But I liked him as an actor. I thought he was really good. He had real, real you know, quite a good presence, and yeah, um, yeah. So it's great to see a uh, son of another great actor um, in the show. That is Steven Spielberg's son in the middle. Um, and it's funny because they, I can see that there is a similarity there, but not not a huge similarity. Nepotism? Um, what nepotism? <laughs> Hey, look, you know, if you're Steven Spielberg's son, uh, there's got to be a few doors that have got to be. Uh, yeah, open for yeah. You, um, Was he also? Did I see in the credits? Is he also part of the? I don't know, like an EP or something, something to do with the uh, the production as well. Steven that's Spielberg, a, yeah. that's entirely possible. Yeah, um, I say so. So I've said this before on other streams. Here's a funny thing, Barry Keogh who I first saw in a superb film, which I'm sure both of you guys have seen, which is Jan Damage's um, 71. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, set in Northern Ireland uh, yeah, before good, Bloody good Sunday. Um, and, um, you know, this guy gets se separated from his unit. Caught on all the different sides of uh, politics. Yeah. It's a really, really good movie. Have you yeah. seen it, Bart? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, once a while ago, Barry uh, Keogh yeah. has a, um, a a role in it as a young IRA recruit, and he has zero lines in it, no lines at all. And um, clearly, the director realised when he saw early rushes, like when this guy's on screen, you can't take your eyes off him. He's got something. Mm. And I, as soon as I saw him in that movie, I was straight on the phone to my casting director before I'd even finished watching the film and uh, said to her, we've got to cast this guy in Pegasus Bridge. I want him as one of the glider pilots. And um, so straight away, his name was like right at the top of the list. And, and, and the funny thing is, he ended up in Dunkirk and now he's in this. Um, and there were three, three actors that were on that list that all ended up in Dunkirk. And he was, he was the first one. Um, but I, 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 I called it then that he was going to be a huge star. Um, and look at him now, and he's just done Salt Burn, which I could do a whole whole stream about, but we, uh, yeah. we won't get into that rabbit hole now. I don't want to start talking about um, bathtubs and uh, grave, <laughs> grave, grave sites. Um, but yeah, he's good. I thought Barry Keogh is good in this. Because um, there's a lot of people doing fake American accents, but at no point did I... Was I taken out and going? Oh, that accent's not very good. You know, I think one yeah. one thing British actors do do pretty well is a good range of different um, accents. This isn't one of the original control towers, is it? Inside Man, they would have built this for the. Uh, for the yeah, I think this was. Uh, it is very very difficult to say. I I would say that it probably isn't. I'd say that's a build. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd say it's a build because um, I've seen enough of the originals to to yeah. spot. There's a there's a couple of minor um, little little differences there. Um, I also I'll tell you I'll tell you some of the other uh, things that I really liked was um, the, the thank God they didn't do that Hollywood <laughs> thing where they had people constantly taking their masks off unless they were below yeah. ten thousand feet. Yeah, because you can't. Because you'll die, no. I think is is that yeah. fairly correct? You 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 would lose yeah. consciousness. Yeah, I um, think I think they, they estimated in around about fifteen seconds, um, you'd lose consciousness. And, and, and that, I, I that loved fear. the fact that they did that scene where the guy took off his gloves to to um, deal with the stoppage in his machine yeah. gun, and yeah. his hands immediately froze to the metal because yeah. the metal oh. was so cold because yeah. they were above ten thousand feet, and it would have been yeah. all metal would have been you know, ice cold freezing. Um, yeah. That something like that wasn't covered in Memphis Bell, which is a great movie on the, pretty much on the Ooh. same subject. And if people in yeah. the chat haven't seen it, they should definitely check it out. Were you a fan of Memphis Bell, Bo? Yeah, film? yeah, yeah. It's a great film. Yeah, I, I'm interested in um, all sorts of uh, the history of aviation from the Wright brothers 
onwards uh it, it's it, any anything like that so yeah no absolutely absolutely of course uh, mm. but i think i think ugh, i might be wrong but i think it's fair to say uh, so far anyway that this uh seems to be sort of uh, ultra realistic which is for me which is great yeah um yeah. Uh, you, you know it, it seems uh, i feel i feel comfortable that the people that put this together have gone to great lengths Right, it, it, I just feel confident in it. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah. have you ever seen the? You must have seen the film, The Duelists. Yeah, you know, one of one of Ridley Scott's special. Early in film. that film, in that film, you just you just know that uh, they've gone to extreme lengths to make it uh, authentic, yeah. and mm. and and this feels like that to me now. So I don't know the exact insignia when it comes to history. I'm sort of an all rounder. Uh, ancient history is really my is really my forte is what I was right. Thinking. So, but so when it comes to um, like the minutiae of insignia and things, I, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm far from an expert, but sure. I, I just I just feel like um, I'm in safe hands with this, you know. I mean, I, I'd go as far to say that I bet that that plain tail with that symbol and that number and that squadron emblem and all the rest of it and whatever they're part of why 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 squadron or, or why group or uh i bet that's all completely correct yeah um you know and, i mean i know when we were shooting that second unit stuff for paratrooper with the the push by the um i can't forget if it was 21st panzer or whoever it was that was pushing to attack pegasus bridge we we made sure that the symbol on the back of the tank which you only see for like a second was the correct symbol it was like a pair of oak leaves for that unit in that place for those yeah. sb guns at that time um because that stuff is quite important to get correct and like you say people like yourselves appreciate that kind of attention to detail ah oh, the critical drink has popped in i did say to him he was welcome to come hey. on uh <laughs> if he if he fancied it um actually i didn't check to see if he applied to that message so i ought to check now uh, we're uh, blessed we're but yeah, mate, by his you presence. Yeah. Uh, um, no, and I'll drop you the um, I'll drop you the link because I'd love to hear his thoughts on. Uh, well, well, one other thing I I would say, uh, let's hope, fingers crossed, uh, Will comes in. Um, yeah. Is that there's certain things when I talk about history um, on my own channel and on Lotus Eaters, oh, I go yeah. all over the place. Everything from Gilgamesh uh, through to the Falklands, right? Right. There's certain things. There's certain things that people are absolutely unforgiving if you get something factually wrong. Yeah. Absolutely unforgiving. Um, uh, tanks is one of them. If you get anything even remotely wrong, uh, people jump all over you. One of the things, it seems, uh, is is uh, uniforms, particularly mm. World War II era uniforms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems to me, if, you know, and, and they wear all sorts of badges and insignias and uh, all sorts of stuff. And if anything's wrong, uh, people get annoyed by it. Um, and as I say, I, I'm no expert, far from it. Uh, but I feel like, I mean, could you tell us inside, man? I feel like they've got everything spot on. Uh, I, uh, I would uh, see in terms of um, what we did for Band of Brothers, it's it's the same level of detail. It's exactly the same level of detail on this. Um, everything on Band of Brothers, literally everything on Band of Brothers from the way the buttons were sewn on um right. was absolutely yeah. accurate um you know all kinds of you know this the stitching on shirts the types of ties um and um the one of the strange things was that um you know even though say for example they would have just had all of these uniforms on they would have had all of the underwear as well they would have had the vests <laughs> on as well um right. which is what which was what exactly what was done for band of brothers so um so the vests would be the same um some characters will have the same underwear you know the sort of gi issue um underwear mm -hmm. um it's not you know it's not because it, it's not one of those things where um you know it's like well if you don't see it it's you know it, it doesn't really matter there is that but when it comes to this sort of thing that Spielberg and Tom Hanks does, um, particularly with the assistance of Dale Dye, um, who is very, very insistent on the immersiveness of each of the characters and the extras, all, all of the background people uh, being correctly attired and equipped. 
um, you know, because he's a historian himself, you know, he's a fantastic historian, a very, very um, knowledgeable military historian. Um, and yeah. he will know, him and his staff know when something is awry. You know, they really, really do. Um, yeah. They don't bring him and his his men on for no reason. Even yeah. in this shot here, you can see the kid on the left. See, mm. the, see the way the coat's too big for them? That's because it's a hand-me-down. Yeah, which is what what the kids would have been given yep. back then because of the shortage yep. of clothes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, talking of band of brothers, uh, one of our brothers is popping in. Hello, hey, sir. Hey. Hey, how's it going? How are you, Hello, Jacob? Mate. Good to see you. Yeah, see. likewise, man. It's uh, yeah. The last time we spoke was uh, talking about Napoleon. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, just waiting serious. for the call up uh, to come back on, or you can come on load seaters whenever you want. Uh, really, please just yeah, let me know and we'll have you on. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to do a, like another historical movie, um, countdown or something that'd be quite good. Yeah, it's great of you to pop in because I know Sundays are quite quite precious for you, and uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I won't take up too much of your time, uh, because no, I've got no. a few things to do later. I'll yeah, like to come in and um, I guess just pick your brains a little bit about this show. I know you've already been covering it quite extensively um because i've not had the chance to see it yet um and i was just curious about it oh. because um yeah I, I see it on apple tv um definitely gonna watch it because i'm getting so many recommendations about it um yeah i guess i was intrigued at what what is what it is about this that's making it so compelling it's, what is it's, it works so i'm well? very i'm very happy with it overall it's the attention to detail is what we were just talking about before you you came in and and you're straight into it. I would have liked a bit more setup. I, I would have been quite happy for there not to have been an action mission in episode one, and it would have been more of a training. Here you're getting to know the characters, but then the the flip argument to, that's been given to that, as we've been talking about it, is a lot of these people didn't have a lot of time to get to know each other, and some of them were killed before they even knew each other's names. So there's an element of that that's real as well. Um, but just purely from a drama narrative point of view, because there are a lot of characters. There's almost like a good fella-esque sequence in a bar where someone's narrating and says, this is Jimmy and this is Bob and this yeah. is Fred. <laughs> and so is it all it, focused it, on one one bomber crew? Or is it no, like it's, it's across a, a whole squadron? It's, 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 a, it's the mighty... Uh, yeah, it's the 100th bomb unit. Uh, it's 100th bomb yeah. group, sorry. Yeah, the, the bloody 100th, bomb. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, gr a group and the various... Well, it's, it's actually the, the, it's, it's the 100th bomb group. Yeah, the bloody hunt. Yeah. Uh, Drinker, I would say uh, it's only two episodes in, but I would say it's decent. It's worth yeah. your time. Uh, yeah. It looks mm -hmm. great. Uh, it's There's nothing really annoying and obnoxious mm. about it so far. So no. it's, pretty, it's almost certainly worth your time, I'd say. So so the, the bombers aren't actually piloted by strong, empowered women. <laughs> <laughs> no, no there, there are some strong, empowered women moving cows around in the fields. Because right, yeah. All that farming uh, work. No, but, I, you know... It feels yeah. like a while since we've had uh, a show like this. You know, like you obviously mentioned Band of Brothers. We had the Pacific and, yeah. you know, now we've got this. And you don't get that many World War II um, shows or movies these days, that kind of craze that came out. I've been trying to make one lines. for about seven years, but yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> maybe you're ahead of the curve. You know, maybe we're going to get a resurgence of World War II stuff. I don't it know. It would be great. I, I, I do think, I think this is going to be, a huge success and I'm, I'm really hopeful that um i was saying this to one of my producers the other day can you not get someone interested in either pegasus or paratrooper now there's got to be yeah um and uh she she was telling me she gave me a list of all the things people are looking for in a show right now you don't want to know um, yeah i can guess yeah <laughs> but uh and i said well i think you know I have a feeling this is going to be really big. And I think someone is going to say to somebody in a room, can we have something else like that, please? And if you're yeah. in that room, please uh, put your hands up when that happens. But um, they cover a lot of things that you didn't get to see in a show like Memphis Bell. Like the character that's on screen mm. now, who's a very new actor, he's very good. He's the guy who's in charge of patching up the planes. And he gets a special mention in like episode two. You kind of, uh, and there's a whole sequence about how the, the crews work feverishly overnight to get the planes ready for the missions uh, the next day. And then, of course, their downtime is supposed to be during the day once the missions have taken off. But they're so emotionally invested in each plane that they can never sleep because they're waiting to see which planes come back. 
So I, I imagine being part of those crew must have been almost as stressful mentally as, as you know, being on the, in a different way, but as being on the plane. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, for all the guys back at base, you know, you're kind of powerless to help, I guess, when your buddies take off and go on their next mission. And, you know, Memphis Bell captured that pretty well when the, yeah. the planes are coming into land and they're counting them off. And it's like, oh, shit, we're missing like one, two. And, you know, that, that all you can do is sit and wait and hope that they make it back. It's got to be I mean, a as much as, as much as I like Men Memphis Bell, as, look, as much as I like Memphis Bell, it, it's, it, it's, it's a bit family friendly for me. And I think... Um, I mean, yeah. this is this is very very much a grown up thing like uh, Band yeah. of Brothers and, and the Pacific. I think if you if you're going to show anything about war, it has to really be grisly. It has to be awful. It they don't to, they, to, they don't they don't spare on the gore. I mean, there's one sequence where uh, whatever it is, Mr. Schmidt 109, you know, yeah. literally riddles the whole cockpit of a couple of uh, different bombers, and and you, you see all the bullet hits and. Well, yeah, and Im imagine if you get hit by like a twenty millimeter round, that's going to do yeah. quite unpleasant things to the human body. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't I think they're, they're, they're in, their intercept. I beg your pardon. Their, their intercept speed or their their approach speed was in the region, depending on which of the aircraft it was. Uh, the B seventeens, I think they were their top speed was something like three hundred and forty two to three hundred and forty eight mile an hour. Um, sure. The Fokker Wolf uh, one ninety. Uh, was about 415 so you've got an intercept speed there or or an approach speed of mm. over 700 mile an hour um and with the 30 caliber rounds being shot straight into you know into, you know there's the, the, the reaction time is very very limited but as you say you know these 30 caliber rounds coming through a very very thin shell thin aluminium shell of uh, the uh, the b17s is going to tear you apart and, and they can, they did, yeah. and you, you know, I guess when you're piloting a uh, plane like that, you really can't do much evasion. You know, these are big lumbering mm. aircraft; yeah. they're not designed they really for are, yeah. dogfights. You just got to fly straight and level and hope for the best. And that's why it was very important for them to maintain formation as well, because that was their best defense. Well, they can. Well, I guess they oh, they've got their turret guns and stuff, but yeah, yeah. One thing I thought in this, uh, because it is sort of in some way an heir to Band of Brothers and Pacific, I thought mm. the, the the violence was, is so far anyway, has been handled quite well because in yeah. Band of Brothers, there are some gruesome bits, but quite yeah. a lot of the time in Band of Brothers, it's sort of cut away. And it's not, it's definitely not uh, completely gratuitous in Band of Brothers. No, it's, uh, it's, in, it's in, in Pacific, yeah. I did feel like sometimes it was. Anyway, in this, so far, it, it's not. You see some bloody horrible things, but it's not yeah. reveling in gore. Mm. Where I did feel like in Pacific, it did a bit. Uh, it really did. did you yeah. guys think that? Yeah, yeah, I mm. thought so too. I thought so too. I thought it was. I think it was excessive. Um, there was no real requirement of that. Whereas with this, I kind of get the feel that it, it, the similarity between this and Band of Brothers is there is, you know, a profound the profound psychological effect on, on these, these men that you do see in Band of Brothers. Mm. You know, you do see the alteration. You do see I mean, almost a, a degradation of each of the characters um, um, and, as they go through, you know, from in Band of Brothers, from Takoa right the way through to the end of the war. There is a, a, a degradation in, in character. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see that here. Um, I know there's, there's, you know, having read the book and a couple of the other books, um, yeah, there was a, a pretty, pretty serious uh, psychological effect. Well, that, that, you know, one yeah, thing to quite say is that casualties are were, were absolutely giant. I mean, they yeah, lost horrendous. more. The Eighth Air Force lost more guys than the the Marine Corps in the, the entire Corps. Corps. Yeah. Theater, like 24, yeah. 25,000 odd guys, just air crew. That's an in incredible attrition, really. Absolutely mm. incredible. Yeah, no, was there wasn't, not a uh, discussion car... about suspending like daylight bombing raids for a while because they just couldn't yeah. maintain the, the it, attrition it's rates? It's crazy. Sorry. Well, 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 wasn't the chance of an air crew coming back doing their full tour, wasn't it something like one in 18? Or, or it, was, it was one in one in four. Oh, was it one in four? Uh, okay. one in, only one in four would 
would um yeah I, I look funny enough i looked at the statistics well, one in four would survive the war uh, one, one in four would survive the war so i think it really depends that is, at that what point, you know, in, uh, in, no. in, in, in mid 43 is very different to early 45 when the luftwaffe is almost annihilated but yeah the point is is that going sort of unescorted by fighters again more in 43 mm. and 44 and mm. uh so you haven't got any sort of fighter escort and in daylight the mm. the top brass of the americans uh, for some reason had convinced themselves that wasn't mental but it was the numbers in hindsight anyway uh, yeah. the numbers prove that that was a terrible idea just a terrible mm. idea i think um, they they clung almost to the end of the war actually yeah, they clung yeah. to the idea that mm. massive um aerial bombardment of of german cities would be eventually enough to break them um, and it never did. Like it just, if anything, it just kind of galvanized them to resist even longer. So it was just like a bit of a waste. Like obviously there was a lot of damage done to industry and so on, but it, it never yeah. forced a surrender. It was just. Yeah, I, I think that was that was the whole idea behind the daylight bombing. Was it? Wasn't it? It was the the um, the desire to to operate precision bombing runs. Um, yeah. Whereas ours were more arbitrary you know uh, that's taking nothing away from the the heroic man of the raf um but <clears throat> there was a lot of indiscriminate bombing they they didn't know where their targets were it's just you know the, the the idea of precision bombing in the 40s was a nonsense it, yeah it's just a nonsense really um, yeah this whole uh, um dropping a bomb into a pickle barrel was garbage yeah i mean at least you know if you can see your target then you can get your bombs somewhat in the right yeah. area like yeah. but obviously yeah. if it's at night time you could drop them in the middle of a field or something and it doesn't do anything it's it's a little bit guesswork yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 bomb, uh, did, didn't bomber harris call it city busting hmm. um, um, yeah. yeah he was an interesting character yeah. i mean they mentioned that the numbers of times they have to drop their bombs in the sea on the way back to england if they don't yeah if they don't actually get to attack the target. I don't understand why yeah. they didn't come back with full loads. Was that too dangerous? Or was it a fuel consumption? I guess it's a fuel consumption thing because their fuel must have been based on well, I their think the, weight. The, the bombs are fused uh, as well once you once you take yeah. off. So like, if yeah, you try and I, land I, I with them... Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, if uh, maybe one of your um, one one of the uh, the wheels can't come down, you know, you can't get the undercarriage yeah. down. Yeah, that would not you be... You have uh, to do a... Yeah. Yeah, I guess, um, and you're carrying a full load. They don't. That. I mean, it's, it shows in the show. I think it's in episode two. They don't take the fuses out of the out of the bombs until they're in mm. flight. Like the mm. keys, there's sort of like a key yeah, it's just a pin. Yeah, so they pull out. Yeah, yeah, they 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 take like a bit like a pin in a hand grenade, and they take that out when they're about twenty minutes away from the target. And so some guy has to get up and go and do all of that. In this very cramped space, mm. I'd be thinking like, "Fuck that!" I yeah. wouldn't want to do that job. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, it was very good at capturing the crampness of yeah. the inside of the B seventeen. I thought they did that a lot more effectively than um, Memphis Bell, where I yeah. felt we were very much in a set. Where whereas here, I really mm. felt like we were stuck inside the plane with them. One other thing, I would just say, sort of a general point about about the strategy of it is that mm. um you know britain uh, the raf rather had been um doing raids on on germany or, or nazi occupied europe for quite a while before the the u.s army because of course it's not the u.s air force the u.s air force doesn't exist until 1947 the eighth uh, it's it's the army the, eighth the army air corps is, isn't is it? under the army air corps that's right um and so the idea was that what we want to do really is bomb mr hitler night and day just round the clock, <laughs> uh, which again on paper isn't a bad idea, but the reality was, was just sort of cr crazy. Uh, you know the real reality of it, uh, and so you end up with, um, you know, uh, you, you'd rather be an infantryman or a tanker or in the navy. There's this classic thing that history nerds do. If you're in World War II and you could pick to be an, an infantryman or a tanker or, or a submariner or something mm. or in a, a, a a uh, Lancaster, uh, what would you pick? Well, for me, I immediately rule out uh, being in a, any sort of heavy bomber, whether it be a Lancaster or a B-17 mm -hmm. or something. I was just like, no, no, no. I, that, I, I, if I can choose not to do that, uh, I, I definitely yeah. would. What, what, uh, what is it they say? There, there are no foxholes in the sky. Right, yeah. Because <laughs> if you go down, you're going to die. 
I, I wouldn't yeah. really want to be in a tank either. Like anything that you can get stuck inside when it's on fire doesn't seem yeah. like a fun. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, the idea yeah. of being a submariner for me is pure hell. That, yeah. that, for yeah. me, it feels like the most terrifying thing to be in a submarine in combat. I, I, yeah, if if I could not do that, please. Well, especially a uh, World War II uh, submarine. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, particularly the uncomfortable conditions. I mean, you mean, we've all seen Das Boot, haven't we? So, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, that was terrifying. Isn't there a, isn't there's it? a isn't there a Greyhound TV series coming? Didn't I read that? that? I'm not sure, actually. I, I mean, it's certainly... Based in on the Tom Hanks movie. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's in development. doesn't mean, as we know, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think um, that's been... A, because it did so well, straight away, there, were, there was talk of a sequel. And then the next thing I heard, that, that there was a TV show um, in development. Mm. So, uh, so I know. I, I know Tom Hanks brought up a load of World War Two stories, and he. I know he did the. Um, he bought the Ben McIntyre right to the Ben the Ben McIntyre book. Was um, that like an impulse right? impulse purchase buy at the till while he was buying his yeah. Greek island? <laughs> yeah, and he went. Oh, yeah. I'll get some uh, World War Two properties at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Agent, Agent Zigzag was one that he that he bought that was in development for a while. I don't know whether he still has the rights to that, uh, but his his company were developing that. That would have been an interesting one, but I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just getting very interesting noise coming from my neighbours upstairs. So, um, one last quite, thing I, I, I would like to say, if it's all right, Lance. Uh, absolutely. Just, just in the sort of general sense about the Eighth Air Force and uh, sort mm. of the strategic bombing campaign over uh, Western Europe, is you know. The war in 1943, say, which these episodes start with, where they're bombing things like uh, submarine pens, or yeah. they're bombing um, sort of very, very specific um, sort of uh, factories, uh, uh, and then, but but by the end of the war, people like Curtis LeMay or Bomber Harris, uh, you know, the Eighth Air Force, the RF, can be accused of um, some. Uh, some things that are unnecessary. Again, the idea, the grand strategy being that every it, where, where Mr. Hitler had turned every civilian into part of his total war program mm. is that well, we need to we need to uh, incinerate or annihilate civilian po populations. Uh, of course, I suppose yeah, I mean, yeah, the yeah, ultimate thing absolutely. is, is Dresden. Yeah. But um, yeah, Dresden. I was going to say was yeah. That yeah. Big by, by the end, that's right the at the end of the war, isn't it? That is right at the end. But, um, yeah, but I think as well. By, like by the they, end, they, they, they essentially they ran out. Using, they were actually using napalm, weren't they? The Eighth Air Force at the end of the war, at the end of the Second World War. I thought it was only a Vietnam thing, but they were actually using really? napalm. Well, yeah. incendiaries. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know with the incendiaries, it's more just like a, a you know. A, a very small bomb that burns fiercely for a short time, and it's like yeah. you drop hundreds yeah, they're, they're of them. They were phosphorus, I think, white, white yeah. phosphorus. But uh, but in um, in Harry Crosby's memoir, he says, you know, we did actually do some questionable things. Um, you know, it comes to the end of the book and said, at the end of the war, we did some questionable things, um, and that was dropping these uh, phosphorus incendiaries and this this new stuff called napalm, which is kind of like a sticky jelly. That yeah. just burns and burns and burns. I mean, I suppose that the tanks, the, they had plenty of flamethrower tanks that would use a variation mm. on napalm. That's all yeah. it was. It was just jelly gasoline. Um, and yeah. you can see the, the footage of it is terrifying because it's yeah, just liquid it really flame, is. like going for a couple hundred feet. But um, I guess part of the problem was towards the end of the war, they'd just run out of military and industrial targets to blow up. There was really nothing left. Um, and all they all they could do was target cities by that point. Uh, like this I say, is the... the um... This is the this is the first mission in the the first episode is to bomb what are known as the Valentin submarine pens. Here is the real thing. Good it's luck with there. that because they're like impregnable yeah. practically. Well, it, I, I know. Yeah, I mean they 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 were built to withstand a direct hit. Um, now um, you'll you'll see it in the show. It's it's outlined the route that the planes had to take. So if I zoom out, you can see that it's uh, it, it's just outside of of Bremen, but the route that they took to find them, and then when they got there, the cloud cover, they had to they had to come to Bremerhaven, which of course would have been covered in flak, and then follow the river down mm. to get to that target. What a nightmare route mm. that would have been! Um, and then when they when they first flew over, they're, they're coming over the coast, so you're going to have a whole load of other flak there. 
Um, yeah, not not a, not a fun day out. Uh, I mean, imagine how difficult it would be, or how easy it would be to lose your way as well, because you pick the yeah. wrong river, suddenly you're heading off in completely the wrong direction. It's not like there was GPS or anything in them days. <laughs> no, yeah, they um, they had these um, splasher signals, didn't they? Um, so so you had a radio guy that would be uh, he would be conveying some some radio information onto the navigator, and the navigator would have to do the calculations to work out exactly where he was obviously using a compass as well but um really really difficult and i think you know harry crosby um he does say that he's you know he wasn't the greatest navigator but he ended up being the group navigator for the bloody hundredth um <laughs> that's one thing i always find interesting to remind myself about world war ii it's the 1940s everything is so primitive yeah Right, they mm -hmm. haven't even got like uh, uh, cassette tapes and things, right? I know it's funny to say that, but like no when, you listen to, when you listen to the music of the 1940s, like most of the armies uh, weren't mechanized, you had horse, horse drawn stuff a lot mm. of the time. Yeah, aviation was extremely primitive. The Wright brothers had only ever done it about 40 years ago. Uh, the yeah. idea of having a, a heavy strategic bomber like the Lancaster or the Be or the Flying Fortress or something. It was a new concept, really. Mm. Uh, they're, they're sort of, they're, they were the sort of the cutting edge of, of, of aviation. And it, it's just, I think it's really important to remind yourself that the 1940s, everything was just so primitive compared to our world. Yeah. Um, well, it, it relied much more on, I guess, human ingenuity and resourcefulness and... Yeah. Yeah, you know, to some extent as well, like the, the disadvantages that one side experienced, they were mirrored by the other side. And so each side was kind of hampered by these problems um, of, you know, navigation, of range finding, of, of all of these things that you needed to do to get to your target. Well, the other the other side would experience that as well. So it, to some extent, it balanced out. But yeah, it just must have made their job, which was already massively stressful and difficult, like an order of magnitude more difficult than we would experience today. Mm. Um, it was just amazing yeah. how much things advanced, though, in the space of, what, six years? You know, mm. in that mm. time, mm. when it came to, like, naval engagements, you suddenly had these, like, by the end of the war, these pretty sophisticated, like, calculating computers, basically, like, mechanical calculators to work out distance, um, you know, trajectory, speed, all of those things that would tell you where to fire your shells to hit a, an opposing ship. And be reasonably accurate you had jet fighters that became like a mm. real viable thing you know you had rocket power yeah. planes you had uh, ballistic missiles all of mm. the like yeah, yeah you had computers that could decode um, encrypted messages by the end of the war like all this stuff happened in the space of just a few years just from sheer necessity yeah uh, it's impressive not to mention the achieved. nuclear bomb impressive. itself well oh, yeah there's that too yeah, yeah. with that small one as well yeah um, no, but it's incredible. The same you can say the same about uh, World War One. The the yeah. the sea change from 1913 to 1918 in terms of just just aviation or something. Yeah, uh, it's it's a it's an irony. Perhaps irony isn't quite the right word, but it's an irony that the worst thing that humans do to each other, i.e., war, um, mm. actually uh, boost the progress of the whole human civilization it boosts yeah. it it super boosts it mm -hmm. um so yeah as drinker says in sort of 1939 you've still got um uh, sort of almost slightly better than world war one era aviation and by the end you've got jet fighters and v2 rockets which are essentially cruise missiles and you've got yeah. the nuke it's like yeah it's a, it's it's very very interesting to remind yourself of that I think. Mm. yeah it's funny they i think the germans even experimented with like precision guided bombs because they they had radio controlled bombs that you could drop to to take out ships basically and it was on it was basically attached to a really long cable that you could pilot remotely Obviously, it's difficult when you can barely see it because it's getting further and further away. So they thought, wait a minute, if we attach a camera to the front of this, the, the pilot can see it. And so they did. And you had like a really primitive smart bomb, essentially, that they yeah, developed. Yeah. Like, it was never in enough quantity to be like a real threat. But again, what a cool idea. And obviously, it's, it's standard procedure now. But these things were thought up way back when. Mm. This is the actor who plays the main narrator in the show, who is the character of Crosby that we've mentioned 
um, several times. Relative unknown. Uh, I think he's going to do very well out of this. I'd, I'd be surprised if we um, don't see him in a number of other things. And he's quite endearing. He's sort of a bit of a bumbling nerd. He 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 nearly makes a really bad mistake and lands his crew in occupied France uh, in the in the first episode, which I believe is based on a real incident. Um, and by the second episode, he finds yeah. himself as lead, lead navigator. It's, it's of kind of based on kind of based on a real incident. Yeah, that, oh. I mean that's kind of based on a real incident, but it's uh, it's yeah. somewhat exaggerated. Is it? Was it embellished a bit? I did wonder about that. It, I really yeah, it was they, they, they didn't. Oh, they didn't actually. Yeah, they, they they didn't actually get to the coast of France. They were on their way to the coast of France, right, but. Okay. Um, it yeah. wasn't quite as uh, close as it appeared with the uh, AA. No. Sorry, Bo, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I really like it when they use uh, actors that aren't massively famous. I agree. Because, because you then uh, don't know who may or may not live. You know, that's a classic yeah. thing, particularly in a movie, is that there's an A-list actor that's on the poster, and you know they're not going to die in the first 10 minutes, unless they do the whole alien John Hurt thing. And yeah. um, it's very deliberately they've killed the most yeah. famous guy at the beginning, yeah. which is rare. They, that's quite rare. So yeah. anyway, when there's a cast um, where, you know, there's no sort of super famous actor where you just know that whatever happens, they're not going to die. And so you get some real suspense. They can actually play around with the yeah. idea of suspense for real. And uh, well, I like that. It works for me. Uh, it, it felt like we could lose anybody at any time right, right, yeah. when they went on the missions, um, want, which is the yeah. co- which is the complete opposite of any Expendables film that I've seen. <laughs> um, you know, because we can't lose them because we need them for the next sequel, um, where everyone's going to make lots of money and not pay attention to the film. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it it it's because if you have that suspension of disbelief, you're invested and you know. Oh, we could lose any one of these, and you're, and you're rooting for them. But if you're watching a an action-based movie where you know that the main characters aren't going to ki- get killed, all the action of itself becomes completely redundant because you're removing the element of jeopardy before the, you're even getting into the action scenes. So it doesn't really matter who fires 500 rounds at who or who drives their motorcycle in between 20 tanks in a ruined Russian city. <laughs> you know, it's 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 if it's Stallone that's driving the bike, he ain't or Statham, he ain't gonna die. You know, as long as they've got Chuck Norris by their side, they will be okay. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it's like it's the classic problem, isn't it? Like the moment you feel safe in a movie or a show like this, where characters yeah. feel safe, um, you, you're not doing your job properly because the no. audience is no longer feeling the tension there, and they should with something like this. I think that's what, the, for the, the, I mean, we're a little bit off topic, but it's for that very reason why I just stopped watching superhero films because it didn't matter how big or spectacular the fights were. It was just like they were kind of, the fights kind of became redundant and dare I say it, they also became rather boring. Um, yeah. Whereas here, I'm, it's okay. great. You know, the, the violence, the action is very brutal. It's very swift. It's very quick. It comes out of nowhere and, um, you know, but I think what, one of the, one of the things that they've done with this, which, which I think um, really plays into exactly what you're saying there, um, you, you know, you don't know who is who's going to be next off the list, um, is I, I know it's always done whenever you see a World War II movie and you see the Yanks over here, you know, this kind of vicarious living, this this um, this you know all out for a good time kind of. Uh, GI life that they had whilst they were over here, but that's precisely mm. why, you know, exactly why they were like that. You know, this this cool. vicarious living because they just didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. Well, uh, yeah, it's what, not, you know, there's, there's well, there were so many American babies uh, uh, born. <laughs> I mean, you know, people were, you know, we, we, we used to have a TV show, uh, Will, you probably would have been a wee band when it was on, I think it was ITV, but it was, it was called, um, we'll meet again. We'll meet again. And it, it wasn't, oh, yeah. it wasn't actually, uh, um, a bad show and you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. I mean, it's, it's shot in a very dated format. Um, so, yeah. you know, obviously that stuff hasn't aged well, but it's all about the relationship between the civilians and the Americans. And uh, it's a bit of a drama soap, but it, it was not yeah. bad at all. It was quite a good, no, good show. 
I've, I've actually got the whole series on DVD somewhere. So. Of course you have. Yeah. Uh, uh, Drinker, I know you've got to shoot off because uh, you're about to do a 10-hour stream with uh, <laughs> yeah, Pretty much, yeah. Um, uh, I know your your channel's coming up to 500 subs now, so well, do you want to give yourself a plug or plug anything? Yeah, you know, just, uh, two million thank you for things. giving thank you for giving me the chance to come on. You know, get oh, some mate, exposure. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I'm going to do one of these every Sunday um, around the same time. It would be great if you want to pop back on, even if it's just for a little bit. Once you've seen it, to give us yes. your your views, because I'm going to do you know it's dropping weekly. And I've yes, I was going to say the show is releasing weekly, isn't it? So yeah, it's yeah. easy for me to yeah. catch up. Yeah, yeah I'll so, probably do that then because I'd like to. I'd like to cover some of this with you. Yeah, you guys, yeah, uh, yeah. It'd be, be great, great to sort of di digest it as we as we uh, go along. But uh, obviously, you have got open bar on Thursday. Uh, anything else special coming out uh, next weekend? I'm going to be in Orlando for MegaCon. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah I mean, if you're in Ooh. the Orlando area, I guess come along, and I'll be there with uh, Nerdrotic, with Eric July, Geeks and Gamers, and we will be meeting people, signing autographs or whatever, and partying okay. hard as much as we can. So it'll be a busy weekend. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, look after yourself out there. Uh, America's, uh, you know, full of interesting characters. It's an interesting place to be. Uh, I just want to say, Lance, um, this yeah. this absolute legend up here. Oh, up here. There he is. <laughs> yeah. He sent me an awesome uh, poster for uh, Big Trouble in Little China. And I think it was like an original cinema one that you'd had for forever. Uh, um, and you... the, the They Live poster i sent you is an and original, that as well yeah i've got both an of original them. british cinema quad which was up here but i've got the journey poster up there now oh my mic's in the way but you know yeah yeah the, the journey poster's up there now look. um very nice but um yeah yeah I, I, I used to work at the cinema so i used to take every poster i could get my hands on and i also used to work at a video shop and i used to take every poster i could get my nice. hands on and the video shop got sent the american quads so that I didn't have to keep reproducing the British ones, which were more expensive and on better quality paper. Okay. Uh, yes, you, yeah. So, yeah. I was so pleased with it. I got it framed immediately, and now it's got pride of place in my bar. So thanks, man. Ah, I appreciate all right. that. No worries. So we'll 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 we'll, we'll toast it when I have a drink in your bar one day. <laughs> uh, nice. When, when I get to Scotland again, which hopefully will happen this year at some point when it's when it's warmer and there's less uh, snow. Yeah. Uh, well, look, Thanks for popping on, mate. You're always uh, welcome, and um, uh, it's great great to have you pop in. And I really yeah, look forward to hearing to your, you, your own thoughts um, about the show. And also, let me know when you've watched uh, Bates versus Post Office. I'm keen to yes. hear your thoughts. Yeah, thoughts on I've, that. I've got I've got a big list of things to get through, but yeah, thank Never you, man. Never ends. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Keep doing the awesome work that you're doing with your channel, though, mate. And uh, same to the rest of you guys. It was great to catch well, up with you. Yeah, yeah, Krabby yeah. Patty says this drinker well. guy might make it on YouTube one day. Yeah. I, know <laughs> one I day. reckon he's got something. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think we, we may see him again. Uh, All right. Thanks a lot, mate. I'll speak thanks, to you man. soon. Catch you guys later. Cheers, Will. Thank you, mate. Uh, he's such a legend. Um, yeah. So, uh, what else is there to say? Uh, we won't go on too much longer, but. Um, uh, like I said, I, I think we've all said we do like the cast. The cast are good. I, I Actually, one of the things I do want to do now, I, uh, do you remember who the casting director was on this uh, um, Inside Man? Was it Andy Pryor on, in the UK? Okay. I, I have uh, absolutely no idea. Well, you know what? No I want idea. to give them a shout out because I think they did an excellent job casting this show and casting directors don't get mentioned very often as my casting director is always telling me. Um, and, and she is right. They don't get mentioned enough. So let's give the casting. Look at the size of this cast, man. I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling. It is a very, very, very big cast. Uh, all those producers, lots of them. Um, so the music's by Blake Neely. Um, we kind of mentioned the score earlier. You, you like the score, um, Bo, for the show? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it sounded great. After two episodes, I sort of, uh, you know, got it. So... Uh, for me, that's quite quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Usually, yeah, yeah. I'd have to rewatch a whole series a few times before it sort of clicks and I know it and like it. So the fact I got it after just two episodes means that I'll, uh, it's probably really good. Mm. I mean, so he's got an unusual you... track record. It's, it's, it really, really does have an unusual track record, considering that most of his stuff is television and most of it yeah. is sort of DC Legends, Supergirl, and uh, Bat. 
girl and um, oh, maybe but he was... obviously he also did um it did Greyhound as well so probably was pleased to jump at the chance to do a more sort of traditional score because it does feel yeah. very traditional yeah, yeah um, and there's not too no, much kind of dan, 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 you know there's not too much of that um Lucy mm. Bevan and Olivia Grant uh cast nine episodes each I imagine I know Lucy Bevan is uh, English based I imagine Olivia, Olivia Grant's probably US based uh, art direction on the show was very good huge team there I won't read out all the names but um Colleen Atwood's uh, done a lot of very big productions. Fantastic job with the uh, costumes. Is it is it one person directing the whole show? Are they, they different directors? I would have imagined on the on the show. Uh, it was look at all these uh, COVID uh, crew yeah. uh, credits. Crowd like? COVID third. Yeah. Crowd COVID third assistant director. Because uh, of course, the COVID shut the production down at one point, didn't it? It, it just mm. goes to show you, you know, how long ago this this actually was. You yeah. Know, when you when you think about it, it was. Um... Size of that art department. Look at this. I'm lucky if an art department on one of my films has like three, four people in it, and that's that's like a big art department for me. Look at this. The size of this. It's <laughs> like it's, it's like almost like a hundred people here 150 maybe the, the, the thing is the things with i suppose with something like this it it is required isn't it i mean well they've, really they've got the money they've got yeah. the money um i don't know how much it was per episode but i, I know that with um with banner brothers i think it was something like 10 million per episode or something like that yeah it was uh 10, um, 10 to 10 to 15 i think yeah per rep. yeah and at um, that particular time i think it was the most expensive show that that or mini series that had been done. Um, I mean, this obviously exceeds that. So um, I've got a couple of questions uh, before we wrap it up about sort of stuff we're, we're going to see down the road. And I don't want to um, make too many presumptions because I want to judge each episode as it comes out. But my understanding is we're, we're going to see uh, some action with the Red Tails, uh, the, uh, the, the or otherwise known as the Tuscany Airmen. Um, it's been or the a couple Tuskegee of, Airmen. Yeah, there's been a... Yeah. Tuskegee, thank you. There's been a couple yeah. of films about them before. Uh, one was very good, and the other one was Red Tails. Um, <laughs> uh, so the the, uh, the TV one that was made some time before that, which actually has real footage of one of the attacks in it, was was mm. I thought was a really good movie. I actually mm -hmm. do own it. Um, so we're going to see a bit with them. My understanding is they're only attacked. They were only attached to uh, bombing units in the. Um, uh, the theatre of the Italy and Sicily uh, and Africa. Yeah, the Mediterranean. Yeah, Mediterranean. Thank you. Yeah, That's the yeah. word that I was having a brain fart about. Yeah. The Mediterranean campaign. Um, yeah. uh, Bo, do you know if this particular bomb group was reassigned to that campaign at one point? I don't know for sure, but I didn't think so. I thought they were most famous for because uh, I, I my knowledge isn't completely extensive, but no. I think they are most famous for doing um well the ones we've already seen yeah bombing into berlin ended up yeah. bombing That's, all the yeah. way into berlin yeah. um uh famously there was one bit Regensburg, where they right yeah yeah a couple more than once i think or ravensburg and then uh bugging out to north africa i think that's the next yeah. episode when yeah. they do one of the one of the wings uh, raids deep into Germany and then instead of coming back to Britain goes down to North Africa. I didn't mm. so obviously that's over the Mediterranean, but I didn't think they were all that involved in actual, you know, like the war in Sicily or the war in uh, to liberate Italy. But I but I don't know. My knowledge isn't isn't complete on that, I'm afraid. I think that was the possibly the 94th, 96th, 303s, 305 and 306. Although um the, I, I believe that the the bloody hundredth did perform something. I think, I'm sure it was a raid on Seuss in Tunisia. Mm. Um, okay. I, um, I think they were. They, I think they may have been part of that. Uh, I know there was kind. Of, there was. Um, there was. Oh, just trying to think of the. the they were. I think that they were part of a backup force for uh, Operation Torch. I believe. Um. Anyone in chat wants to uh, <clears throat> fill us in on that? One, let us thing, know. one thing I would say that I, I I I don't know, but I hope this is uh, what you see in in some of the later episodes. Sure, is that um, to in in nineteen forty four, 
or getting on towards the end of the war, the Americans started building in in numbers the the, the Mustang, the P fifty one Mustang, right. um, and, and they started putting the Spitfire Merlin engine in it. Yeah, which which, which upgraded. It was night and day difference. The P fifty one before and after that. Anyway, after it, right. the the Mustangs could basically escort uh b17s and stuff uh most of the way into central germany and back wow. and of course that makes like th that's just a massive 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 difference uh, yeah because there was an extra so, fuel tank invented around that time right. as well that they carried right. on the underside of the uh, exactly. bit like having a bomb attached to your plane that you don't want to get shot with but yeah exactly right. just also, increased also, their it, range it, hugely yeah yeah sorry they, and they didn't have a, a gravity fuel feed either um it, it basically they could they could be in any position so um you know they could they could really pursue um any incoming aircraft the incoming incoming luftwaffe um because yeah. apparently what they used to do was the um the 190s the 109s the 110s used to go underneath uh the bombers and of course any escorts that they had any minor escorts that they had which may have been um spitfires or or hurricanes they couldn't go after them they couldn't mm. dive down after them because they had a um they have a great they 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 had a um uh a gravity fuel, fuel feed which basically means that they rely on it being pretty much being vertical um right. sorry uh, sorry horizontal so that whereas would cause the, it to cause it to cut out uh if you were the, yeah yeah and the p51s had a non-gravity <laughs> fuel feed which basically meant that the, the, the fuel would pump regardless of, mm. of whichever so, position they're in and so before the p51 or before the upgraded p51 anyway there'd be quite often p47 thunderbolts yeah, which are just yeah. not they're just not up to anyway i'm hoping i've got my fingers crossed that in the later episodes of this we're going to see, they're going to show us lots of dogfights, uh, fighter on fighter dogfights, sort yeah. of spinning around the flight. World War II machines. Top Gun uh, is uh, kind yeah. of where you're going. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Um, I want to give this little museum a shout out. Um, I've actually been here, um, the 100th, 100th Bomb Group Memorial Museum. Um, it's a tiny place. Funny enough, I mean, now we're looking at it. They they could have shot at that control tower. It is exactly the I, same if you look at the roof. They, they actually that was actually a rebuilt. Believe it or not, they rebuilt that. Right. Um, they, so they obviously went and visited this tower. one. And um, yeah, I, 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 was, yeah. I went and visited this um, not that long ago, um, and actually was taking photographs of it and stuff. Uh, again, when we were scouting paratrooper locations and. Mm. Um, when, when it looked like we might be back on again at one point, and the, just that you know, this little area alone was incredibly useful for filming. Where is um, that, Lance? Is that in East It's, in, it's, it's, it's in, in Norfolk, Norfolk. Um, right, right, okay. and there's a number of original control towers in Norfolk that are still in one piece. There's like three or four of them actually, if you if you hunt around. Um, and uh, and then there's more, of course. You've got the the famous airfield at East Kirk Kirkby, which if you've not been there, uh, Bo, you absolutely must go. Fantastic. That's where the Lancaster is. Um, right, right. It's surprising, you... actually, how much stuff is still around. Because I was born yeah. and raised in the southeast of England, in Essex, really. Mm. Uh, and Horn Ho Church was actually one of the big uh, airfields uh, at the time. And anyway, just dotted around the landscape, certainly in the southeast of England, are pillboxes, yeah. old airstrips. Oh, yeah. They're all over the place, right? Yeah. It's incredible that they're still there, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have, you, have, they... you been, have you been to North Weald? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loads. Yeah, grew up in and around Northfield. Yeah, in, oh, right. in, in a yeah. sense. In a sense. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's probably about ten minutes away from me. That's where we we, oh, we right. shot the opening episode of the Band of Brothers was all show over at Northfield. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, doing some filming there. I don't know what that's for, but um, probably a, a, a an indie film. But, it's funny. Um, you go to a park somewhere, or a, or a, just a, a a bit of scrubland, or anything, and there's a hmm. there's a 1940s pillbox. You know, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. On the beaches, and there's some pillboxes there, and you think we actually thought we were going to have to defend the country uh, against yeah. a Nazi invasion, and that there would be machine gunners that were supposed to hold this pillbox until the death, <laughs> a, a, yeah. until until the Wehrmacht used a flamethrower to kill them. Yeah. That's what this pillbox was. It's like deadly serious, and they're yeah. just left there to molder 
in the yeah. in the landscape of the southeast. It's incredible, really. Yeah, sort of all on the edge of farmers' fields, and you find mm. tank traps there somewhere. Mm. You know, there's, there's always a you, you go to a mouth of an estuary in England. There's always a pillbox at the mouth of the yeah. estuary somewhere, yeah. if it hasn't been washed away. Interesting to note, there's the emblem on the drum kit that's on the patches of all the men in the oh. show. If you look, and oh, yeah. it's, it's that this must be presumably a photo taken at the time. I don't think it's been. I don't think it's a replica. Uh, if you want to visit this place, you can. I've put the uh, link in the chat. I'm all about supporting museums. I'm all about supporting independent films uh, and other YouTubers, of course. Um, you know, and, and it, I think it's a private thing. You don't turn up, so you've got to book ahead. And uh, they do. It's only uh, it's only open a, a certain number of days um, per year. Uh, but um, this place and also East Kirkby, uh, just uh, south of the Humber, uh, well worth well worth a visit. Yeah. So with where the show's at now, um, yeah, looking forward to see where it goes. Looking forward to seeing how these other elements come in and how they introduce us to the other theatres, if if at all. Um, but on based on the first two episodes, out of ten, sort of where you where you at with your score currently? And this may change by the time we get to me personally. I'd say that um, I'm on a nine. To be honest yeah. with you, I'm I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah. Uh, Bo, how many uh, history yeah. bros does it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the barometer. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm quite pleased with it. You know, yeah, I'd give it a solid eight or nine. Uh, there's not much to fault it on. Uh, one of the yeah. things I would say is there's this uh, balance between sort of just action, combat, yeah. you know, lads' own stuff about fighting and things, mm. and then stuff about their private life and hooking up with the ladies and having a dance yeah. and a drink and stuff. Um, yeah. For me, I would like it to be sort of 95% war and combat and 5%, <laughs> if that, about sort of, um, mm. you know, having a drink and, and chatting up the ladies. I, 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 I but, mean... But as much as I love as much as I love the action, and I guess Bridge Too Far is the the ninety five percent film. Yeah, um, well, it's ninety nine percent, isn't it? Bridge Too Far. Yeah. There's hardly anything in it. Anyway, yeah. so far this is um, there's a tiny bit too much of it for me, but only a tiny bit, really. At uh, no um, point am I like looking at my watch and oh, can't we just get back to co yeah. air combat? Uh, so that's my only real gripe. That's the only reason why I wouldn't really give it a nine and a half or a ten out of ten. Yeah. Is that? So yeah, it's a solid eight or nine for me. We so far. We, we definitely don't need to see another bicycle race scene. Uh, uh, right, that was in yeah. fact, in fact, good point. That's the only bit where I did start to think, uh, yeah. you know, I just start to think, I, I'm not interested in this. Can we get back well, to, you know, yeah, the I, war? I, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I like all great. the, I like all the mission stuff. Um, I, I assume I was wondering about the model planes on the sticks. Oh, yeah. And I was thinking they actually look like fairly modern kits. And I was wondering how much basic, more basic they would have been. Um, and I suspect they would have been a, a lot more basic to show who's flying in which groups. But I'm really niggling uh, talking about that kind of thing. But I like the fact that they did a whole scene about the breakfast and how you always got a really nice breakfast before you went on a mission. But then, of course, yeah. people would be throwing it up on the plane. Um, mm -hmm. So th th all that sort of detail. I like the detail about the, the time that they get woken up in the morning. Yeah, and you know that the guy would come in with the torch, and you didn't get any of that in Memphis Bell. At least I don't remember it if if it was in no. Memphis Bell. Um, so that sort of like minutia of this is what their days like. I liked all of that. I because I, 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 I got a sense of yeah. you know of, of the world. It's yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, and I think that I think that's pretty much. I think that's what these two episodes were designed to do to give you a sense of their world, their yeah. everyday lives. Um, and now that's that's it. Yeah. I think you know. Now we know what their world is. We know what world they live in. We don't need to see any more of that world. I think that's where the lines going to be drawn. And I think that we're going to be seeing much, much more. All right. Okay. Uh, so, um, well, we'll, the, we'll probably area, we'll start to wrap it up there combat. for today. Uh, History, bro. Tell us a bit more um, about the Lotus I can tell you now. channel before you go. Uh, sorry. Say that again. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry, inside man. I think you had a lag then, um, momentarily. Did you? Did you have something to finish on there? Oh. No, 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 no. It's fine. No, it's You're cool. right. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, Bo, um, mm. tell us a little bit more about your channel and the and the the Lotus. Um, okay. Yeah. Lotus sure. Thing. So, well, I do two things. One, I've got my own channel, History Bro. 
Yeah. Uh, which I've been doing for a while. And it's, it's quite Damn small. It. It's uh, I think I just surpassed <clears throat> 16,000. Uh, not much. Well, I'm only at, for, I'm uh, only at 3,000 <laughs> 3, and something. So you're doing all right. <laughs> Thank you. And there's all sorts on there, uh, really all sorts. Um, uh, but then I also work for the Lotus Eaters, uh, which is uh, they've got two channels. One is the daily podcast, live daily podcast, which is more like politics and uh, sort of commentary, um, sort of non evergreen commentary. Um, that's got a 300 odd thousand. But then with, within the Lotus Eaters, I have got my own history themed weekly show, for want of a better word, called Epochs. The epochs of the Lotus Eaters, where every week I, re I I release something that's an hour, an hour and a half, two or two maybe two hours long, um, something about history, um, and right. so and so that's sort of my second thing uh, where you can find me talking about history. So yeah, those two things. Um, yeah, so thanks for letting me mention them. Oh, yeah, no, not at all. I was I was going to actually pull up the page with the Lotus Eaters on it. But you'll find this hugely entertaining. My mouse has just died. <laughs> I don't, oh, even, know, I don't thing, even know if I can end the stream in a minute. Um, one thing sorry to mention is History no. Bro is just entirely free. It's just me on YouTube. But the right. the, the, the Lotus Eater stuff, uh, there's the, although clips go out, sometimes quite long clips, sometimes like sort of 20 minute, half hour long clips, the whole thing is actually behind a paywall on the website. I mean, right. that's that's the model. It's a company, you know, it's a business. They need to make money. So uh, Indeed. It's, to, to see all of that, you do need to pay five pound a month. So I must mention that. In so case I'm going to go over I'm there gonna... and it's then annoyed that they've got to pay. So no, 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 I'm going to. That's right. I'm going to. Here we go. I've managed to get my mouse to work again. So this is this is the correct site. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's the podcast. Yes. So, yeah, that is the web. That's the main website. Yeah. And um, so that's an example of the daily podcast. Okay. Uh, but then so we, there's, there, there's, there's like all it, kinds of different go on, if you go on video uh, on top left there and there should be one that says history or epochs or something and that'll be that'll be my stuff history okay, yeah, here, we go, here we go here we go and then uh and there you go and so there's uh like 143 143 wow. episodes of me talking about things usually in conversation with someone usually in conversation with Cole benjamin aka sargon of a cad uh, but with all sorts of people, oh, there's one or two with Drinker. There's a few with Apostolic Majesty AM. I don't right. know him. He's very, very good. A few with, where's one with Mauler? Uh, but yeah, anyway, there's lots and lots of content there. Well, if you're a ever few, doing um, anything, hours. if you're ever doing anything World War II, um, count, count, consider me up for it, you know. Oh, um, sure, sure. No, absolutely. Uh, uh, there's, other area, there's other periods of history that I'm pretty uh au fait on um as well so dmbm foo is another big subject of mine because i was designing a board game on it at one point vietnam yeah yeah right yeah. okay well i actually haven't got anything i have already done a three or four, no four or five part series on market garden but i haven't no, got so anything I, on vietnam I would love to have been on that i haven't got anything on vietnam at all so i I'd, uh yeah come on and we'll talk about vietnam yeah i mean that's a fantastic documentary series the one that was on um I think it premiered during lockdown. It was another one of the shows that did very well out of lockdown. Um, but I remember a really good documentary series on Vietnam that I saw as a kid in like, I think it was like the eighties or um, late, late eighties. I want to say it was out around the same time as um, the really good one on the American civil war. Was um, it Ken Burns? The Ken Burns one. Yeah. They, they, they were on one after each other on BBC two. Do you remember they were both on the same night and you, you watch, the American Civil War one first, which tended to be less gory, and then the Vietnam one was on after the watershed at nine o'clock. A little before what... my time, but I have seen them since. Yeah, uh, actually, Vietnam was one of the things when I was sort of a teenager uh, that really, really, really fascinated me. Um, and I'm I'm surprised at myself that I haven't really made much or any real content about it yet. So yeah, it'd be great. As yeah, it's funny because the the first movie I ever saw about vietnam probably would have been platoon hmm. and i was at the uk opening night premiere of that odeon leicester square wow. and um and i remember it was so quiet because it was such an intense film and, and it was new we hadn't quite seen a film quite like this before and there was a bit where this guy got his 
part of his face ripped off by a booby trap when they're trying to go round back into that tunnel complex. There's, there's like a scene where a kettle boils or something, and like the, there's a kettle been left on a stove because the Viet Cong have fled and and it's been booby trapped. And somebody in the cinema, I'll never forget this, yelled out 180 like it was a bu- like it was a bull bullseye, like it was funny. And they nearly got lynched by the right. audience and, and right. they had to be taken out of the cinema because people were so offended and rightly so. Mm-hmm. Um, so sorry, strange random story there, but but uh, one that I've just remembered for the first time since it happened. <laughs> so uh, so check out the Lotus Eaters, check out History Bros. Uh, channel inside man you're going to be having your own youtube channel in the not too i am in the not future. too distant yeah yeah and uh, you and i are going to be doing a regular spot uh, yes we, we haven't got a we name are. for yet we but we'll, 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 um, we'll we'll think of something and it's um it's called retropolis now um and retropolis now <laughs> retropolis now yeah. retropolis now um, I like that. so i i've not I've not launched it just yet, but I'm kind of scripting some videos at the moment. There's so many right. things. It's, 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 I'm going to be focusing mainly on uh, on older films, much older films. Yeah, you a mean the good exploitation in there? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got a stack of black exploitation that I'm going to be reviewing. Um, some giallo, um, a lot of kind oh, of you know cool '70s crime stuff. Yeah, yeah. Some old yeah. war films. A little bit of. Uh, a little bit of macaroni combat movies, a few spaghetti westerns. Um, some, can I some can I horror. request you do the Warriors? I rewatched the Warriors the other day, and uh, yeah. I, it was much better than I remembered. Uh, yeah, but... it's 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 a it's a phenomenal movie. It really it's is. Kind of it's really great. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, um, and and I'm open to all kinds of suggestions. So I mean, I've got, I think. I, in my list of opening videos, I've got um, the spook who sat by the door, which is an amazing. It's Fight Club before Fight Club. Um, Not seen, an amazing, that. but yeah, black black exploitation movie. If you haven't seen it, it's actually on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. It's right. um, very very good, based on a fantastic book of the same name. Um, I'll be chucking in um, the Dirty Dozen um maybe a bit of kelly's heroes um uh, right so count, of, count, 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 count me if you're doing a Pelham stream on either of them count count me in for sure um but uh yeah i mean Absolutely. obviously videos, are yeah. videos so are you'd be you'd be top of the list you'd be, um yeah. I, I just mentioned yeah, to you yeah, Bo, you'd, as you'd well that you you did a you did a uh premium episode on waco which is another massive massive area of interest of mine Right. Uh, and also the Falklands is another thing. I, I actually oh. um, gave Drinker um, uh, a link to watch an ungentlemanly act, uh, which he'd never seen. Um, and uh, I think he's probably watched it by now, but it, this is big. But but I've seen every film ever made uh, on the Falklands, including all the documentaries and the Argentinian films and documentaries as well. So yeah, On my channel, History Bro, I did a conversation with an actual Royal Marine all about the Falklands. Uh, what was one of my wow. earlier videos. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, uh, what was the other thing you just you just made? Waco. Waco. Uh, quick, very, very quickly to say on that. It's one of the few videos where I got quite a lot of pushback. People weren't happy with me. It's one of the few, in fact, probably the only video I ever did where people got pissed off with me. Uh, because I was quite rude about David Koresh and Seventh Day Adventists. They didn't right. like. They didn't really take any criticism mm. of Seventh Day Adventism. Um, so if I ever talk about Waco again, which I'm absolutely happy to, I'll just probably be a, a, a little less critical of that. Watch, watch the watch the drama series. Um, they made two. They made one about the siege, which is very good, and then uh, with the same actors. Mm. They did one about the court case that followed afterwards, which is uh, it was really interesting. And I, I, I mean, I remember seeing the, one of the very first documentaries about it with the FLIR footage that was shot from the plane that that you know was released in that documentary. So that documentary got banned in America. And um, uh, I, I mean, it's a whole other topic, but you know, we won't go we won't go down that rabbit hole now. Okay, so. Any idea of a date inside, man, when you're going to launch your channel? Uh, a month this year? It's, 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 it's going to be in February. Mm. It's definitely going to be in February. February, okay. Yeah. All right, well, so coming if up anyone, next... If anyone wants to just quickly... Um, go for uh, it. I've, I've, I've got my... Uh, I've just set up a 
uh, Twitter slash X account. So if anybody wants oh. to follow me on that, um, I've, I'm following a few people myself. You want to type um, it in the private chat, and I'll drop it in the um, I'll drop it in the uh, comments in a sec. Yeah, yeah, okay, and um, in the yeah, so, chat. so um, and um, yeah, so it's it's going to be it's going to be February. Um, All right, and you know, I hope to do a few sort of live streams and uh, a few. Yeah, a few videos and, you know, we'll, you know, we'll take it from there. And, David uh, Macy says, uh, are you going to show your face? I think the answer to that is no. The world isn't ready for the beauty of the uh, inside man. At the no, time. no. I might, I might um, show my ass. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a whole <laughs> different topic. So, which, um, which, which has a better smile than my face. There we go. Hugh Edwards style. Cut, 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 <laughs> coming up on the channel next, we've got the... Nielsen Ratings on Tuesday, which is our kind of regular uh, chat show. You can sometimes catch the inside man on that if he's not too sleepy or hasn't got a four o'clock call time the next day. <laughs> um, this <laughs> week's episode is going to be, it's normally at 10 p.m. UK time, but I'm actually going to go later because I am doing a board games test in the evening and I'm not quite sure what time it's going to finish. So, uh, which is a Vikings uh, battle, by the way, uh, history, bro. Uh, probably a period that you might find quite interesting. So we're doing a big game at Salute, which is the big war games convention once a year in London. Um, we're doing a Vikings game. Our games club is running something. So we're playtesting the rules on a Tuesday night. So I might be a little bit later with the Nielsen ratings, probably going to start at 11. Later in February, I have got director Ron Underwood coming on the channel on February the 13th at nine o'clock in the evening, I think, at GMT, GMT time. Now, if you don't know the name, he directed City Slickers with Billy Crystal. He also directed Tremors with Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward, among other things. He's also done several episodes of the Walking Dead uh, franchise. And we expect some other special guests to be dropping into that stream as well. And I do mean very special guests. You don't want to miss it. So um, like, subscribe, spread the word to your friends about that one. Guys, and that will be industry interview number 53, I think, for me. And I've got more lined up, including one really special guest that I can't wait to announce. And Inside Man has hooked me up with another one. So there's going to be a, a few of these happening. Um, great. Listen, thanks for everybody in the chat for participating. Thanks to the Critical Drinker for the surprise pop in. That was really lovely. We're going to talk more about this next Sunday at the same time. Look forward uh, to it. And every Sunday until the, the show wraps. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, don't forget to call the people that you care about and tell them that you, you miss them. And uh, we will see you all again real soon. Bye. Bye.